Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, yeah, so I uh, will kind of sum me up quite well there. I'm going to be talking about Binder. So let me just share my screen with you all. So first of all, what I need to do is to apologize for being that speaker who changes their title at the last minute. Um, but don't worry, because I only added two words. So I'm going to be talking about sharing reproducible analyses with Binder at scale. But first of all, what I want to do is I want to thank all of the people on the Jupyter Hub and Binder Hub teams and the wider Jupyter ecosystem itself for all of their hard work um, and the diverse set of skills that they bring to this project. We really wouldn't be able to do it without all of the people we have involved in this. Um, and I'm putting this slide here simply so that um, I can acknowledge all the hard work they do and I don't run out of time at, at the end of this presentation. So what is Binder? We are a global community of um, data scientists and software engineers, and we are dedicated to facilitating reproducible research. The mybinder.org service, which I will be mostly talking about today, allows anyone to launch a complete interactive computing environment in the cloud simply by clicking a link in their browser. And here, what I mean by complete is that everything is included the code, any packages you need to run the code, any data, any pros, any assets, and that, and such like this. Basically, what Binder does is it provides you the computational environment without all the pesky installation of packages. So this is what Binder looks like from a researcher's perspective. We have Jane here. She's written a paper based on her experiments. And what she wants to be able to do is she wants anyone to be able to reproduce, check, and verify her calculations. So what she does is she describes her experiments in a Jupyter notebook. This is a form of literate programming where you can mix code and prose and visualizations together. So you can get like the narrative of the code as you're running through it. And she also includes other resources like any source code, any data or media. And what she does is she bundles all of that together and she publishes it on a publicly hosted repository such as GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab and other repositories. And then to make that repository binder ready, she creates a configuration file that describes the software that is required to run the notebook. And if you're a Python user familiar with like pip installing things, then the requirements.txt file, which is just a plain text document that lists um, packages, then that is your binder configuration file. It's already working with the community standards of how you describe your software. So by combining this version control publicly hosted repository with the version control best practices and um, software documentation best practices, this allows anyone around the world to run and reproduce her computations. But I don't want to really talk about reproducibility today as I think we all know how important reproducibility is to the advancement of research. And I think Malvika in a couple of um, talks time, we'll talk about the Turing Way, which started as um, a guide to reproducible data science. But what I actually want to talk about today is how we grew this open infrastructure of what Binder is and how we scaled that up. So this is the humble beginnings of Binder. It was first launched by Jeremy Fried Freeman in 2015. And Jupyter first got involved to help out with maintenance and providing the service at the beginning of 2017. The first half of that year was spent redeveloping the back end into what we now um, describe as Binder Hub. In September of that year, Binder was granted a more foundation proposal and Jupyter and eLife also began a collaboration to develop the first reproducible and executable research article. And I think that was published in um, March last year as well. So from these very humble beginnings, you can see that we've grown from a prototype to a staple of the open science community. And actually we are hosting over 140,000 users per week. And not all of these are just researchers sharing their analyses with each other either. Um, we host a range of workshops using Binder to um, disseminate knowledge. And uh, we even have live coding data streams from people like DataCamp. 
um, that hosts like 700 participants as well. So this shows that Binder is not just a vehicle for sharing research, but it's also a very important educational tool to help people develop their digital skills as well. Basically any environment where it's going to be difficult or problematic for your attendees to install their computational environment and get that set up correctly, Binder is going to be an asset. So how do you flexibly support 140,000 users per week? That was the question we were asking ourselves. And it turns out the answer is a federation. So this is the Binder Federation. The mybinder.org website is supported by four clusters all around the world, including one that I myself manage at the Turing. And the reason why the federation is so important is because it allows, allows us to be um, sustainable. Um, so by sharing the knowledge and the and um, the resources amongst these clusters, um, we make sure that the service continues to be available despite of changes, in spite of changes with resources and people. So by decentralizing this knowledge, we can um, help to guarantee the longevity of the service. Um, so and when I say decentralization, I'm talking about sharing of power as well, not just not just blockchain or whatever. It also allows us to be robust against um, cluster outages or funding streams if we lose a cluster e through either like um, computational issues or there's not enough or it has to be downsized because of um, funding issues. We can spread traffic out amongst the cluster and we can also be a bit more, I'm sorry, I've forgotten my last point. But also, so Binder Hub is, um, developed open in a modular, in an open source fashion. And it means we're actually in this really cool area that this federation is supported by four different flavors of Kubernetes, for just for hosting one website. And in fact, we're not even entirely cloud-based either. The GESIS cluster, which is the second largest cluster in the federation, is actually an on-premise facility hosted at the Leibniz Institute. So what this means is because it's an open source software, it doesn't require um, cloud, cloud vendor lock-in. That means anybody can take this software and deploy it for their own use. So if you want to deploy it within your institution and share among specific teams, which I've represented here by replacing the globe we had in this comic with a little house, um, you can do that. Or indeed you can um, deploy your own binder hub and and apply to join the federation as well. So what open source technology do we actually use to be able to build a binder hub? So this is a screenshot from the mybinder.org webpage. You basically copy your um, URL of your GitHub repository or whatever repository into the form and you click launch. And then this cycle here um, talks about the steps that happen between you clicking launch to your browser being redirected to your um, your computation environment. So the first thing that happens is your GitHub repo is cloned. And then a tool that the binder team developed called repo to Docker. This comes along and builds a Docker image according to the instructions in your repository. So according to those configuration files, your requirements.txt files or whatever, it builds that image, it copies all of your code, all of the contents into there and packages it all together. We use Docker to execute this image. And then we have a Jupyter Hub that's um, sitting on top of the Kubernetes cluster underlying a lot of the technology we have here. What Jupyter Hub is doing is allocating computational resources, in this case from our Kubernetes cluster, to the running Docker container. And it also makes that container accessible at some URL. And then Binder can be thought of as this thin layer um, across the top of all of these technologies and it is handling um, URL resolution and also is responsible for redirecting the browser, the user's browser to that computational environment. So as you may have gathered, um, the Turing's collaboration with Binder is part of the tools, practices and systems. This is um, a new research program that is cross-cutting and represents the work that needs to be done so that research in any domain 
can be progressed reliably and responsibly. And we have some rules of the game that we are baking into this uh, research program so that it can be as open and as inclusive as possible and beneficial for everybody. And these are the two rules that our collaboration with Binder represents. So by designing something that's inclusive and interoperable, we can pull in the expert, the device range of expertise from the entire Jupiter ecosystem and beyond, and we can get more people involved in participating. People can use this um, software for their own needs, or they can join the Federation and help grow this community. In terms of leadership in open research, Binder very strongly believes that um, we're not forging a path but instead we are listening to our communities, meeting them where they are and implementing the features that are most useful for them. So these are some links where you can find out a little bit more about Binder or get involved. And I've got a couple of tutorials up there if you'd like to run through as well. And I also have this bit.ly link. If you remember a couple of years ago, LIGO discovered, made the first discovery of gravitational waves. And what LIGO actually did was created a notebook that ran through the analysis of how they picked out that signal and that notebook runs in Binder. So if you would like to be an afternoon astronomer, astrophysicist, please check out that bit.ly link, bit.ly slash gravwave binder, and you can see the power of Binder. I really recommend trying that link on your phone as well and because this service does work in any browser. Okay, that is it from me. Um, thank you very much. Great stuff, thank you, Sarah. Our next speaker is Georgia Aitkenhead. Georgia is a research associate, associate at the Turing, currently collaborating with the UK autism research charity Autistica to build an open source citizen science platform investigating sensory processing and navigating environments. She's gonna to talk today about citizen science to empower, co-creating a citizen science platform. So over to you, Georgia. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about a project I'm doing with Kirsty Whitaker at the Turing to co-create a citizen science platform. Um, this is fitting into the tools, practices and systems value of respectful co-creation, although arguably it fits into all of these. I think these are integral to the project. Um, and it's at this interesting intersection of three different types of quite cutting edge methods for doing research. So we have participatory research, citizen science and open source development. And I'm gonna be talking in more detail about all of those later on. Um, but first I want to give you some background to the project. So this is um, a diagram showing funding for autism research. And you can see this huge yellow line going up here. Uh, this is funding spent on uh, biological mechanisms and researching that. But this is not a community priority. In fact, only 20%, 27% of UK research funding is spent on community priorities. There's an enormous disparity. How do we know this? Well, Autistica ran uh, a, a very extensive priority setting exercise with the autistic community. Um, over a thousand people took part and they identified the top 10 questions for autism research. And one of the questions is around um, which environments are best for autistic people. Um, so the, the research question itself comes from this extensive priority setting. Um, so we're, we're thinking of um, how can we investigate this? What's the best way of investigating this? We already know that 90% of autistic people have sensory processing differences. In fact, it's one of the diagnostics criteria for autism. But much of the research is lab based and we need to be able to translate it into the real world. So how does it affect people in their day to day lives? We have three goals we want to achieve with this platform. We want to share autistic people's stories and adaptive techniques with others who have similar experiences, educate neurotypical people to better support their autistic friends, families, and colleagues, and also advise organizations on how they can design and adapt spaces to improve autistic people's lives. Each one of these goals is directly impacting the relevant community. Um, so let's talk some more about participatory research. Basically, this is empowering the relevant community throughout the research process. 
In order to design the, um, the platform at the beginning, we had lots of co-creation um, focus group sessions. Um, there were some in the scoping phase that we couldn't record because we didn't have ethics permission yet. They were just for scoping. Um, but, but since then, we've done three sessions, 5.5 hours long each. We did full transcripts. We um, summarized the transcripts and found some emergent themes. So they were coming from the discussions themselves um, rather than being imposed beforehand by researchers. And these all went through uh, an extensive community review process before they were published. And now they are available online at our GitHub repository. Um, and I want to just point out here how why it's so important to consult the people who have direct experience of the thing that's being investigated. Um, here you can see an amazing sensory map, and this is only part of it, by one of our artistic volunteers called Catherine Manning. And she has drawn out the complexity of the question of navigating environments and sensory processing for her. You can see that we would never be able to infer this nuance without having quite a, a rich qualitative data to look at, such as you get through conversation. Um, but really, really crucially, participatory science is much more than just consulting. And here are just some of the things that I think it involves. Uh, priority setting, as I spoke about before, but also decision making, co-authorship, co-presenting, co-designing, community growth. All of these things, all of these areas are areas in which autistic people are not just subjects of research, um, but they are directing the research. So it's redressing quite an entrenched power disbalance that emerges in a lot of autism research. And I think that's hugely important. Um, to give you some further example of this, here are just some of the areas where we needed specialist support for this project. And to put this in some context, we're a core research team of two, myself and Kirsty. Um, and, and seeking out all of this is, is a difficult thing to do. Um, but here are some of our fantastic autistic volunteers who have provided some amazing specialist um, help in the, in the process. Um, again, they're not research subjects. They are the people who are driving the project using their own unique sets of skills and talents and not just being treated as a kind of homogenous group. So um, I've been really, really delighted to work with all of these people and more. This is just um, one ex set of examples. Um, so citizen science, um, this involves engaging people who are not professional scientists in scientific research. There's actually a lot of different levels of this. Um, but the reason why, to come back to the research question that I showed you earlier, uh, citizen science, we decided was such a, a good way of investigating this question, is that it's scalable. Essentially, we can reach many, many more people and we need to, to produce a data set that's actually useful for having the impact of adapting environments. That was one of our main goals. It also means that people who may not be able to attend, for example, a focus group session in person, um, have the chance to do so online. And um, it's much less resource intensive on researchers. So this is just a much more feasible option for getting the kind of rich, broad, um, like, like a uh, highly scaled data set that is useful for answering this kind of question. Um, all this is supported by um, Open Humans, which is a foundation dedicated to data agency and allowing people to have control and ownership of their own data and to share it on their own terms with research projects that they particularly value. So, um, this idea of having data which is fair, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable is really at the heart of this project. A lot of the data that we have is quite sensitive, is quite personal, and it also really belongs to the people whose data it is. So they should have maximum choice over how it gets used. But that doesn't mean that um, we don't do things openly. All of our processes are open, any data sets that aren't sensitive, we do publish and we have the highest standards of data protection. And this idea of a fine grained consent model, which is actively maintained, basically means that we allow people to choose how broadly their own data is shared. 
So citizen science and participatory science, I think, really go together in terms of involving a whole community in research. And finally, I would like to talk about open source development. Um, for this project, all source code is open and available to be used, changed, or shared by anyone free of charge. So everyone who's watching this now in this room, you can access our, our processes, our protocols, um, the data that we have depersonalized that's published here on our GitHub repository. Um, I also think that open source is, can really help with community. Um, here is an example of how that can happen. So this is me on GitHub collaborating with an autistic volunteer to try and understand how we can make these quite complex academic summaries of focus groups accessible to autistic people so that they can decide with the right amount of informed knowledge what they would like to share and if they need anything to be edited out. And my background is English literature, so I tend to write big, long, overly complicated paragraphs. Um, and James was amazing in showing me how to break it down, to use icons, arrows, make things clear. Um, I think this would be clearer for everyone, but also it you can see how involving the relevant community, not just in terms of gathering their data, but in terms of designing protocols, processes, communications is so vital. Um, and I would like to say here that what we do when we gather information, ideas, concerns from autistic people during this project is that they get translated directly into actions for the development of the platform. So here is a parent of an autistic person and an autistic person talking about things that they value that are important to them and that they would like to be features of the platform. And here you can see that this then becomes an issue on GitHub. This issue takes the form of a user story. Um, so this is maybe pretty familiar for anyone who does Agile. I would like to have nonverbal means of inputting information because it enables nonverbal users to share their experience. And then the acceptance criteria will be added by the development team, but all of this will be visible to anyone who wants to look. It's all out in the open. So you can see that there's a direct um, movement from the, from the discussion with someone autistic and their recommendation to the backlog by which the platform is developed. And, and our user stories actually link back to where that was originally discussed. So what you get there is you get um, the ability for scrutiny from the community. Like we can be accountable and show, yes, we really are taking your views into account, but also it allows for more peer scrutiny. And anyone can look at the work in progress as well as the finished product. And so I think that's really important learning in general. I would just like to finish by saying that having a project situated in the middle of all of these three quite new, actually quite difficult types of methods doesn't add additional complexity. What I found is that they really, really support one another to create a space where we can break down some of the professional silos that puts a remove between the person being researched and the researcher and allows everyone to work on a much more horizontal level. And of course, once community begins to grow, it can grow itself. So we, we can have, um, I've, for example, had lots of developers working and co-creating directly with autistic volunteers. Um, and it's become this wonderfully decentralized process. Um, and I, I think this is a really exciting thing. Um, so lots of thanks are due. I also want to say thank you so much for um, inviting me to this panel. This is such an impressive panel to join. I'm really, really flattered to be here with these amazing people. And thank you especially to all of the autistic community participants who are making this possible. Um, please do join us. You really can come straight to our GitHub repository, um, open an issue, pull request, comment. You can share it. You can join our newsletter. Um, we really welcome any input. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, and that's me. Important work. Uh, thank you very much for sharing, Georgia. Next up, we have Malvika Sharon. 
Malvika is the community manager of the Turing Way at the Allen Turing Institute. She works with a diverse community of researchers, educators, funders, and other stakeholders to develop the Turing Way resources and ways that can make data science accessible for a wider audience. Malvika is going to talk today about building a culture of collaboration in our research communities. Take it away, Malvika. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen, but I've been asked to talk for 15 seconds. I would already start by thanking uh, my other panelist speakers for already setting the stage for me. And I'm really delighted to be here. I hope that was 15 seconds and I'll start sharing my screen. I will talk about building a culture of collaboration using examples from our work at the Turing Way. My one big idea to get the next 10 years right for our next generation of scientists and data researchers are shared knowledge. We all have skills and experiences, ideas and perspectives, which can become exponentially more useful and impactful when shared, combined, and complemented to build upon. Specifically in data science, while we work with a lot of people, we aim to have an opportunity to make collective decision based on data with the help of other researchers in our communities. So I know that in our audience, everybody might have very different idea of what data science communities look like. Therefore, I would like to define it to ensure that we are all uh, sharing the common understanding of what we mean or what I mean when I'm talking about data science in my talk. Data science community brings together all stakeholders to practice data skills. These stakeholders are experts, educators, learners, researchers, key decision makers, and enthusiasts from all across the world. And foster a culture of continuous learning. Data science is a growing field, and the only way to keep up the knowledge is to share, not compete for information and recognition. It is a cliche, but humans are social animals. We seek belonging. We trust people and places when we share a common connection. Specifically in data science, we are well positioned for providing such a sense of belonging by offering quality resources, convening state of the art advice from experts from different domains, and supporting new learners by providing them with an environment that's welcoming and safe for them to learn. And this human centric approach makes the data community successful by connecting people and promoting knowledge exchange. I will use the Turing Way community as an example to discuss these aspects in the rest of my talk. The Turing Way is an open source community led project that involves and supports its member from different skills, backgrounds and perspectives in ensuring that data science is accessible, comprehensible and hence beneficial for everyone. This project was founded by Kirsty Whitaker, who is the session lead. Uh, it started as a book on reproducibility with a moonshot goal to make reproducible research too easy not to do. Reproducibility in research can be defined with a simple definition, which means that same analysis steps when applied to the same data set, they should produce the same answer. Quite simple. However, it is a very overwhelming process. It requires researchers to make a lot, of info, a lot of decisions while they go along, from the point of collecting data to focus on questions like, what aspect am I going to answer? What hypothesis will I start with? What is already out there? And who is being impacted by my work? Then collect data while ensuring that no biases are introduced intentionally or unintentionally processing and analyzing data, which also requires choices and selection of tools and statistical approaches, publishing data and research finding while ensuring sensitivity around clinical data and protecting the personal information that Georgia just talked about. 
storing them with complete data history and ensuring the reproducibility by other researchers in different contexts, and then starts the process again. So as an open source community, we invite contributions from experts and enthusiasts alike. They come together to collectively develop guidance, recommendation, and practical resources that can foster a gold standard for reproducible research. Literally anyone can contribute to the Turing way. Everyone has a skill that is useful for someone. And therefore, as Kirsty says here, that could be a chapter in the Turing way. A little over one year, uh, we have now 20 chapters and a growing community of diverse stakeholders. And these stakeholders are again, the developers of the book, readers, authors, reviewers, educators and, and learners all around the world. As the community is growing, our scope is also expanding. Our resources are, are now growing to involve more specific topic on project design, communication, collaboration, ethics, and a meta book on how we maintain this community. As researchers, we are given training on how to do data analysis, what statistical methods to apply, how to make choices for tools, and we're pushed to perform. And it is often assumed that we know how to collaborate, who to involve, what ethical decision to make, and how to communicate our research outcome. But the fact is, we are often not formally trained in these skills. Moreover, there are no incentives for doing these correctly. Often people face challenges and they have to figure out the solution alone. As a community for data scientists, in the Turing way, we incentivize collaboration. We encourage people to share expertise. We invite them to bring their unique perspective and take pride in highlighting their work while enjoying this process of shared knowledge and ownership. It is really about the journey to reproducibility. We have over 150 contributors who are part of this journey, and we thank each of them for their hard work and contributions. Building community requires dedication and willingness to support and benefit all of its members. And therefore, we never take it for granted that we have this growing community. We are really committed to creating an inclusive environment for everyone to perform and be heard. From the beginning, we have invested in intentionally developing a culture that can ensure the system sustainability of our work. So you, you've already seen this slide twice. Uh, we are part of tools, practices, and systems, and the Turing way sits across all these themes. But for now, I will focus on leadership in open research, respectful co-creation, and transparent reporting. We use open leadership principle, which includes and puts emphasis on understanding. So your work is designed to be clear, authentic, and widely accessible. Sharing so that your work can be reused, remixed, adapted, reproduced, and built upon. Participation and inclusion. So your work is actually designed for inclusion to create a shared ownership and inspire contributions. With, with these leadership principle in its core, the Turing way truly promotes a culture of collaboration. Collaboration doesn't only mean what project we are working on and what goals do we have in mind, but really about how we get there, which is, a, which is about treating each other kindly, uh, ensuring that we have a code of conduct so everybody feels safe in your environment while working, we intentionally build diverse communities and invite contributors. Like the project that Georgia just talked about, we also facilitate this entire process on our online repository openly. We clearly explain what this project is and how one can get involved. What are our participation guidelines and code of conduct? Who our contributors are? And with these, we want to not only ensure that everyone feels welcome, but we want to provide a platform that is intentionally inviting to the folks who are missing at the moment, or those who have been excluded from data science spaces, such as members from historically underrepresented groups. Then we fairly acknowledge each contribution so that our members can take pride in what they are doing in collaboration with us. 
We don't only talk the talk, we also walk the walk. We facilitate onboarding and offer ongoing support with the help of mentored contribution. We host bi-monthly Collaboration Cafe, which is a community working space for both our new and past members. And the next one is next week in case you're interested to join us. And we also offer shorter co-working calls almost every day. In the pre-pandemic time, we also hosted in-person Book Dash events that were a day and a half of sprint-like event where international participants will come together and work collaboratively to improve the content in a Turing way. Here are some pathways uh, through which community members engage with us. So first is maintaining resources, which requires reading, editing, taking care of infrastructure, then supporting contributors in their own network, discussing their ideas uh, with other community members, helping to translate our resources in different languages, fixing small errors and uh, ultimately help us design a better culture for a better community. Again, we don't do this alone. There is a lot of uh, work that's going on from the community members. And therefore, I want to give a shout out to some people who are taking leadership effort in the community. So Martina takes care of Jupyter Book uh, infrastructure where our books are hosted online. Uh, members from eScience Center Netherlands, Matthews and Carlos, they are uh, supporting their local communities who are building mutually beneficial uh, resources in the Turing way for their own community as well. Sarah is always the first person who would uh, respond to the new contributors on Gitter channel or on the GitHub and help them orient with the project. Tony is, uh, taking care of translation process so people from different languages can come and collaborate together. We often leave fixing bugs for our new contributors because we recognize that contributing to an open resource is quite hard. And the biggest challenge is to do the first contribution. And these small fixes of typos and reference, uh, these really help, help them to get involved more actively. And finally, whenever we face a challenge, we feel like our culture actually improves a bit. As a community, we try to meet you where you are and offer different pathways to engage with our project. So with this, I want to come to the question, how do we get the next 10 years right? The Turing Way is always a work in progress, as can be aptly matched with this quote of Alan Turing, this is only a foretaste of what is to come and only the shadow of what is going to be. In the next year, this project is gonna continue to grow and will involve even more diverse contributors from across the globe to create an accessible guide to data science for our current and future data scientists. Data science is a field where now and in 10 years, nobody can be an expert of everything. There is so much to learn, so many information all around us, so much to process and skills that we are not trained on, that we are not often expected to figure, we are not often trained on and expected to figure it out on our own. And without a doubt, everybody fails, everybody finds challenges and there's so much that goes on in this journey that we don't talk about. So one of the biggest aim in my opinion is to make this journey easier for next generation. We are literally standing in the shoulder of giants. Our knowledge is built upon the past of data science and it will continue to evolve. We can save so much time and energy for our future generation only if we can make sure that we have a way to pass on our knowledge so that nobody ever needs to build their idea from the scratch. We can ensure that we invest in building an ethical and responsible culture of collaboration so that nobody feels the need to hoard information, but help each other innovate, bring improvement in their society, services, and products. Each of you have ideas that are worth sharing, and you can start sharing them today. With that, I want to ask you to respond to this question, which is what do you wish you had known about data science 10 years ago? And would you like to share it with your future generation? You can reply to that uh, through Slido. And I would like to conclude my talk
by thanking Kirsty Whitaker for starting this wonderful project that I take absolute pride in facilitating. Thanks to all the members from our group and every single person in our community. So that concludes my talk. Thank you, Malvika, for another really great talk. Uh, finally, for this session, we have a double act. Uh, Gwyn Jones is a senior machine learning engineer at IQVIA. Speaking with Gwyn, we have Sebastian Folmer, who is director of data study groups and also health program team lead at the Alan Turing Institute. So over to you, Gwyn and Sebastian. Thanks very much. So let's get the uh, presentation up. Okay, there we go. So thanks very much, everyone. Uh, can you see the slides? Yeah, great. Okay. So um, the, the topic that we are going to talk to you about is um, adopting new technology for machine learning, particularly in the form of the Julia language and the MLJ uh, machine learning framework. Um, the, uh, the issues that we get, the items that we're going to cover include issues that you may face when moving data science uh, into production, why the Julia language can help you tackle some of those problems. We're going to tell you what MLJ is and why you should uh, know about it and use it and how it will make your life as a data scientist a little bit easier. So when you are um, an organization that wants to move its data science work into production, um, the setup that you encounter is normally something a little bit like this. You've got a team of data scientists, researchers who are working on something like a predictive model and maybe a pipeline uh, before that as well. And they are building a prototype. They're using a technology like Python or MATLAB or R. And they're focusing on making sure that the predictive model produces the right kind of predictions, um, that sort of thing. And then you've got a second team who are responsible for putting or what the data scientists produce into the production system. And this can involve a lot of work. There can be a lot of re-implementation. Uh, they may be trying to address bottlenecks in the system, help it to scale, help it to be more reliable, and so on. And they might be working in a different technology, like Java or C++, for example. And the problem with this setup is that there can be a lot of friction between these two teams. They come from uh, very different backgrounds. They have different ways of approaching problems and describing problems and they may be using very, very different technologies. And so this friction can uh, really slow the whole process down, and it can take a lot of effort and a lot of time to get a model into a production system. And this is called the, the two-language problem. So um, at IQV, we have, we have a lot of data, like many large companies. Um, we typically train models on tens of millions of rows of data, and we make predictions on hundreds of millions of rows um, as well. We have an end-user platform that has lots of models in it, and more are being added all the time. So we simply need to uh, make sure that that process is as smooth and, and quick as possible. We cannot take too long here. So, so how can we make our data scientists more effective? How can we make sure that they spend more time with the data set and spend more time making decisions and spend less time fiddling around with the technologies, trying to get it all to work together? And absolutely, how can we avoid any uh, bespoke re-implementation uh, by another team of engineers and all the communication problems that that entails. Next slide, please. So luckily there is an alternative, uh, which is the Julia language. And um, the Julia language is something that researchers and engineers can, can work on together. They can work on a single code base. They can still innovate and quickly get a prototype out. And they have something which is then pretty close to uh, being moved into production straight away. So you don't necessarily need a second team of engineers at all. You can just make, make do with one team. It takes out an entire step of the process. All right, next, next slide. Thank you. So um, when you're adopting a new technology like the Julia language into an organization, you've got to, be care you've got to take care to address some of the, the questions around the deployment of the technology as well as just the technology itself. For example, can you hire developers who actually know how to use this new thing? Can you develop at scale? So yes, you can start off, but then two or three months down the line, are you going to suddenly hit a roadblock where you realize that this is not supporting the scale and complexity of something that you're trying to achieve? Is the development low cost, which in this case means, can you make sure that you can implement something just once and skip out that entire second step? Do you have access to third-party packages? There's a lot of great open source work out there. 
You don't want to reinvent the wheel. So can you take what's out there and plug it into your system easily? And finally, um, can you lower the risk of adopting any new technology, which is when you start to depend on it before you're really comfortable with it and something goes wrong? So how do you sort of limit um, what might go wrong in the system? Now, what's interesting about Julia, so I'll just go back one, one, back to the previous slide, one step. What's interesting about Julia is that there are some design decisions about the language um, which um, address these questions really, uh, really well. So for example, it is fast, is on par with C or Fortran, depending on the problem that you're using. And so you never have to uh, prototype in a slow language and then re-implement in a fast language. You can just do it once. Now let's, let's look at some of the other topics. So next slide, please. So uh, the language is very easy to learn. It is aimed squarely at data scientists. It's based on things that they've seen before. When you first start out, it feels like a basic Python, and you can write it in a sort of Python style um, without worrying about uh, the more advanced features of the language. You can sort of get something running, and then as you learn more, you can come back and, and add more, add more um, complexity and add more um, capability in. And because it's so easy to learn, this means it's also very easy to hire for. So basically, you can take any developer with about two or more years experience in Python, and you can train them up to be productive in Julia in less than three weeks. And the training material for doing that is uh, freely available online as well. So you don't have to hire Julia developers, which is lucky because there aren't that many of them out there at the moment. Um, you can instead make them yourself. And we've done this several times now, and it, it's been a good success. Next slide, please. Um, another, another good... Um, aspect of the language is the fact that it can interoperate with, with the previous technology that you maybe you're used to. So you can bring in packages from R, Python, and you can use them very smoothly, just as if you're using a Julia package. And that means you get complete access to three entire data science ecosystems. And there are many, many things that you can find there to bring in if that's useful to you. But possibly more interesting is that you can do something called progressive development. So if you have a stack already that's built in, let's say, Python, and you want to just introduce Julia into that stack, you can do it piece by piece. You can take a small module, just try it out, make sure that you understand what's going on, make sure that you know how to deal with any errors that crop up. And if at any point you hit a problem, you can revert back to the component that, that used to exist. And so you can slowly, piece by piece, replace your system with a new technology as you get more comfortable with it. Uh, this is what we've done, and it was a surprisingly smooth process. We didn't have really any problems at all. Next slide, please. So there are more and more commercial customers that are, that are trying Julia out for different uh, different things. Um, there are some of the logos there on the slide. And on the Julia Computing website, there are some very interesting case studies, which you can read up about um, the advantages that they brought to their companies by adopting the Julia language. And you can see the link in the top right hand of the slide there. So um, on the next slide, please, Sebastian. Um, yeah, having a new language is very important, but you need more than language. You also need the tools to help you do the machine learning work. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Sebastian to talk about the MLJ machine learning framework. Oh, oh sorry. I seem to have got distracted with childcare. Um, yeah, so so Playmobil, like I, I was taking care of, of my of my, of my two-year-old and my four-year-old, and so playing with Playmobil is great. You have this super amazing castle. You can shoot arrows. You 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 You... I have all these figures, but if you want to do something a bit different, it's hard. You have to start cutting things and it becomes a bit ugly. So um, there's Lego and Lego, um, um, you have this, this model. I really recommend it if you have kids at home, it's, it's really versatile. You can have three dinosaur models um, and even 15 more user contributed models that range from snakes to, um, to fish to, to airplanes actually. And so, how, how, what does it have to do with the talk of toolboxes? So, um, really, you want something fast. You want something uh, like a racing car, but you want to be able to build it in a way that's really organized for you, that you have a workbench where everything is well organized and sorted. And that's what we, what we provide in, ML, in MLJ. So, so, in MLJ, we also allow you to have your freedom. We will support you in building your snake power train. That's something actually my daughter built, and um, um, in, the, in the same way, we want to be able to be fully flexible. So, um, what is MLJ? Um, 
it, it's a toolbox for selecting and evaluating, optimizing, and um, combining machine learning models. It um, allows for composability compos uh, of machine learning models in a way that uh, um, hasn't been thought through. You, you can plug and play. You can take ODE models from slide map and, uh, and plug it in with deep learning models as well as sort of more um, standard machine learning models such as trees, trees, and support vector machine. Um, and we sort of coined this learning learning networks if you really plug and play with different concepts. Um, it's it's well structured to aid an analysis. It helps the user um, to to choose models um, by saving a lot of metadata about the models. Is this model applicable in the current situation? Um, how, how can different models be plugged in play to have the right kind of uh, output structure, be it classification, um, unsupervised, be it um, probabilistic prediction or deterministic prediction. And any code produced in this framework is immediately reproducible, scalable, and deployable. And so, so we, we got to this point now that this is a, it's a virtuous, virtuous um, circ, uh, cycle of contributor. In the sense that, that we have data science and users, and we're not just adding features for the feature, feature's sake, but we really are driven by the, the, the end users that are using MHA to do data science. Um, more broadly, we're sort of in the uh, ecosystem of the SkyKid Learn, the carrots, the, the ML, ML arm. And so, what you hope to do in these machine learning toolboxes is to capture um, um, every Bit of the pipeline, be it the pre-processing, the feature extraction, uh, the model inter in interface, um, as well as all the meta structures, sort of tuning, model selection, um, uh, but also um, having clear control over things like estimating the generalization error through various flavors of cross validation. Um, yes, and so. What makes MLJ um, extensible and expressible? Actually, MLJ is not just one framework. We, we've also used a federated structure in the way that there's MLJ is one 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 sort of package that you can install, but you, we sort of split this up into satellite packages. You can take anything from ensembling, tuning to deep learning. Um, um, and allow you, uh, end users to add their custom built um, learning strategies, models, and tuning strategies. Um, so we started this work on, 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 on our MLJ one and a half years ago uh, through the support of the tools, practice, and systems um, um, framework. And in this time, MLJ has developed to be the leading media machine learning framework. You see, we have a lot of potential and our roadmap is publicly available, but um, what was really crucial and what we want to present today is well, the, the way that we came together in, the, in, in this project as two, uh, two entities with a shared goal. Handing back to Quinn. That's right. So the um, the fruit of this labor, uh, one of the first things that has come out is a new package called Tree Pars and JL. If we can go to the next slide, um, we can we can see that. There we go. So um, Tree Pars and this is the result of some joint work between IQVA and the Alan Turing Institute. It brings automated hyperparameter tuning to the MLJ framework, which is um, a, a boon for the data scientist. It's one less thing for them to worry about. They can leave the hyperparameter selection to MLJ and focus on uh, focus on the data. Um, this is a port of an older Python package called HyperOp to to Pure Julia, and it just plugs into MLJ, so it's very easy to use. If you're a Julia user, you can install it right now. Go into your package manager and type in add true parsing. And uh, if you want to find out more information, the repo is linked there on the top right hand side of the slide. Um, there we go. Uh, just some acknowledgements. There's a wide range of people from both organizations who put in a lot of work to um, make this thing a reality. So thank you very much, everyone, for, for all your hard work. And then on the next slide, we have two online tutorials uh, using Binder. So this enables you to try out MLJ and TreePars without installing anything locally. You can do it all uh, from, uh, from your browser. So please do follow those links. 
and uh, and give it a go. Yeah, just just uh, like if you want to hear more, we, we run a full four-hour workshop on MLJ as part of JuliaCon, which is also online uh, now, like everywhere on Earth. Looking forward to see you there. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.